Welcome back. Uh, the citizen amendment bill is law passed by the Rajya Sabha a short while ago. But the next test could come in the Supreme Court with several petitions likely to be heard challenging the law. Is the CAB constitutional or not? Is it against the constitution? I'm joined by Harish Salve from London. Also joining me is Sutrit Parthasarthi, a lawyer from Chennai, advocate at the Madras High Court. But I want to come to Mr. Salve, who I spoke to a short while ago in London first. Mr. Salve, the first aspect that the bill, according to its critics, is anti-constitutional because the bill, as per Article 14, is violative of the notion of equality. Article 14 says, the state shall not deny to any person equality before the law, the equal protection of the laws within the territory of India. The opposition says the bill discriminates against Muslims, denies them equality of citizenship before law. Your response? Raldeep, I had uh, this chat with the other TV channel also. In my understanding, the principle of Article 14, if you take the emotive issues out of this bill, judge it purely as a legal proposition, the emotive elements apart, this law is a law which creates what I call a reasonable classification because it creates a classification, first of all, on an intelligible differentia. And second, that classification has nexus with the object sought to be achieved. The object of the bill is to deal with the discrimination of minorities as they are in three neighboring countries. If that's the object of the bill, then this classification is perfectly valid. If the object of the bill should have been wider, if the object should have been to cover problems in Sri Lanka, the object should have been to cover problems in Burma, if the object should have been to cover problems in, in Africa, that's a policy object. How wide should India go and its migration permissions is a separate issue. If you test it purely constitutionally on the anvil of Article 14, the court will say what is the object. The object is to deal with discrimination of minorities in three countries. Is that an illegal object? It isn't. Does the differentiation have nexus with that? It does. It passes Article 14. That's my reading. Next is Article 15, which is also seen to be another area where the bill may not meet the test. Article 15 says, prohibition of discrimination on grounds of religion, race, caste, sex, place of birth. The opposition says the bill singles out some communities for granting citizenship, therefore violates Article 15. Do you believe here too, it satisfies this test? Read the opening words. It says no citizen. Article 15 comes in after you become a citizen, not before. Next is Article 21, Mr. Salve. The bill says, uh, Article 21, which says, no person shall be deprived of his life or personal liberty except according to procedure established by law. The opposition says the bill deprives Muslim immigrants of their right to life and liberty. That's the fallacy of the argument. The Citizenship Act without the amendment does not allow anybody to migrate. The Muslim communities or any other community from any neighboring country cannot migrate into India because of the Citizenship Act. This is opening a narrow gate. You are allowing some people to migrate. Before and after, Muslims were not allowed to migrate. Before and after, other communities are not allowed to migrate. Now those other communities can migrate. So to say that this law deprives Muslims of the right to migrate, then we must actually strike down the Constitution, the citizenship law completely. Because the citizenship law prevents the, uh, the, the Tamils who, who claim persecution in Sri Lanka from migrating. It prevents the Rohingyas from migrating. It prevents all the, the, the subsects of Muslims who, who may want to leave uh, Bangladesh or Pakistan from migrating. So we should not have a citizenship law because it is the citizenship law which prevents people from migrating. Not an exception to the citizenship law. Let me therefore ask you the final article that comes in, Article 25. Freedom of conscience, free profession, practice, propagation of religion. Opposition says by excluding Muslims from the bill, it infringes on this right of freedom of religion. Once again, you're, you're free to profess and uh, pr propagate your religion. You're opening the citizenship law on a very narrow ground. How is it anything to do with preventing somebody from practicing or professing a religion? 
See, the religious birthmark is relevant today because those people in those countries are being prosecuted because of a particular state of the constitution of those three states. 25, in my opinion, has no role to play. You're not preventing anybody from practicing his religion. Once you come into India and become a part of the Indian mainstream, then Article 25 protects your civil rights. But if effectively the other argument is the basic structure argument. Do you, the secular character of the constitution is being violated. Do you believe a bill of this kind has gone to the core of the constitution, particularly notions of secularism and equality? Equality we have already discussed. Secu Let us first of all be clear about basic structure. I've always had this conceptual problem about this basic structure argument being brought up. As a rhetoric in a speech is fine. The basic structure theory was developed by the Supreme Court as a limitation in the power of parliament to amend the constitution. Normally, a law cannot be challenged as violating basic structure. Having said so, yes, I do know some judgments of the Supreme Court have in a flourish said that the law also violates the basic structure. If a law violates the principles of secularism, the principles of secularism are not articulated in any specific article. Yes, they pervade the constitution. But secularism is itself a nebulous concept. That is why, while it's a very important philosophy, secularism, since its contours are not precisely defined, there is no precise formulation. So to say that this violates the basic structure of the constitution, I would rather not allow anybody to migrate than to allow minorities of those countries to migrate. I don't see how that violates the basic structure. Secondly, it depends on how you look at this law. If you look at this law saying, I'm extending a facility to the minorities of the three neighboring countries who have cultural and ethnic, mm -hmm. uh, ethnic connections with India to migrate to India because those three countries have state religions, I don't see how it violates secularism to accommodate minorities. There is the only community which is left out is the community which is not a minority in those countries. So in one sense, this is the minority protection measure. I don't see how it violates secularism. The final question I have for you, there is a constitutional test, but there is also a moral test, constitutional morality, Mr. Salve. There are those who believe it hurts the soul of India, it fails the constitutional morality test, it discriminates citizens on the basis of religion, which is against affront to the very foundation principles of this country. So first of all, it doesn't dis uh, discriminate between citizens. It's a question of whom you allow into your country on migration. And on question of morality, we may agree to disagree. You may feel it's immoral. I may feel it's moral. Uh, personally speaking, I don't feel that there's, there's anything immoral in this bill. But if somebody feels that it, India should be more generous, India should allow more people to come in, India should allow everybody from our neighboring countries who has any kind of a problem to migrate, well, then that's one point of view. I don't subscribe to that broader point of view. We can agree to disagree on that. Okay, that was Mr. Salve speaking to me earlier. Now I have Sutrit Parthasati joining me live. You've been listening very patiently, Sutrit. Your view, you've heard, you've heard Harish Salve say, A, he believes this bill is constitutional. B, he says the question of morality is debatable, but he doesn't believe it's immoral. Your view, is it immoral? Is it unconstitutional? Mr. Sardesa, I, I believe it's both immoral and unconstitutional. Now, I think at the outset, we can be clear about the fact that we certainly need a law to protect our refugees. There's no question that we need to offer protection to people who've fled countries facing various kinds of persecution. But I don't think the Citizenship Amendment Bill, which I'm sure will soon be signed by the President, is going to be an answer to this at all. Because any which way one wants to look at it, whatever rationale the government offers for it, to me it is clear that the bill is patently unconstitutional. It violates every known tenet of equal treatment. No, so we, un under we which specific provision, Sutrit, is it unconstitutional according to you? Structure. Which specific provision of the constitution does it violate? Yes, so it is absolutely, yeah. Yeah, let me explicate this. I think for one, eight, violates Article 14 of the Constitution, because we need to be clear that Article 14 protects both citizens and non-citizens alike. So a citizenship law 
cannot therefore be predicated along religious lines. Now, Article 14, which guarantees to all person equal to all persons equal treatment before the law, certainly permits certain forms of class legislation. And Mr. Salve mentioned that it permits what is known as reasonable classification. Now, some of this might sound complex, but the test that the Supreme Court has laid down to examine what constitutes a reasonable classification is actually rather simple and, and quite elegant. It broadly requires three things. First, it requires us to test and look at what the objective of a law is. And that objective needs to be non-arbitrary. And thereafter, we go to the two-pronged test that Mr. Salve mentioned, which is the test of intelligible differentia and rational nexus. So intelligible differentia means that you should be able to separate the class that the law protects mm -hmm. from the class that the law doesn't protect. And ultimately, the differentiation that the law makes, this classification that it makes, ought to have a rational nexus with the object that the law seeks to achieve. And I would argue that on all three fronts, the law fails. Because at the outset, if you look at the objective of the law, I think the objective of the law is arbitrary. Now, if you want to protect people who are facing religious persecution in their home countries and in these neighboring countries, then there's absolutely no excuse for not including Ahmadiyyas who are virtually treated as minorities in Pakistan. On the second front, with respect to intelligible differentia, once again, there's a problem. Because if you're going to differentiate between non-Muslims from these countries with Muslims from other countries and even Muslims from these countries who are facing prosecution, that means that you're not, you've not made a differentia which is clearly intelligible. And thirdly, on the issue of rational nexus, if the objective of the law, let's assume, is to protect people who have fled their countries from religious persecution, then there's again no excuse for not including Myanmar or not including Sri Lanka. And Myanmar, for example, I mean, we know that Rohingyas have faced genocide in Myanmar and they fled their countries facing religious mm -hmm. persecution. So I think on every possible and every conceivable front, this law is violative of Article 14. It is also violative of Article 14 because, as I mentioned, it restricts the ambit right. of its protection only to these three countries. Now, if, you're talk if your objective is to, pro if to, is to protect only pre-partition India, then there's no question, the reason why Afghanistan is included, but Myanmar isn't. Then, but again, I don't think your, your objective can be only to protect religious persecution, because there are other forms of persecution that people face, including political persecution. What about Tibetans who've come to India? So citizenship, in my opinion, cannot be grounded purely on the basis so of religious or ethnic lines. If you want to offer citizenship to people in India who are facing persecution, that needs to be opened up regardless of nationality and regardless of religion. I think you've given me a very, very, very comprehensive answer. And I'm grateful. I hope viewers are listening. You've heard two views. Hari Salve, the eminent lawyer, giving a very different view. Sutrid, the younger advocate, giving his view. I appreciate both of you joining us. And we will. this will be now tested clearly in the Supreme Court. Thanks very much, Sutrid, for joining us. Thank you, Mr. Salve, as well. I'm sure we'll have plenty more voices joining us as they come out of parliament today my take at the end of this long day the citizen amendment bill is now law effectively linking citizenship to religion for the first time in the country's history whether it meets the legal constitutional test will be debated in the supreme court but for now the modi government has succeeded in using its parliamentary majority to push ahead with an ideological majoritarian agenda and yet far away from this numbers game in parliament the new citizenship law has only reopened fault lines in sensitive border states like Assam and Tripura. The fires may be doused, but the scars will take time to heal. The symbolism of the CAB and an All India National Register for Citizens appears clearly politically driven. Vote bank politics has taken precedence over the need to bridge the ever-widening divide and mistrust between communities. The polarized debate within and outside parliament mirrors this growing divide. What is troubling is that those who have criticized the bill are typically being dubbed anti-national and pro-Pakistan today. This only reflects how coarsen our public discourse has become. Referring to constitutional morality while criticizing the new law, Mr. Shah does not make anyone anti-national or pro-Pakistan. By all means, Mr. Home Minister, defend the CAB. But for God's sake, don't dub its critics as anti-national. Else you would, sir, with all due respect, Maybe one day have to dub Mahatma Gandhi and Dr. B. R. Ambedkar too as anti-national. Think about it as you sleep on it. Thanks for watching. 
Bye for now. Thanks for watching the video. For more such news and updates, please like, share and subscribe to India Today. Also check out our other great videos from our channel. We know you would love to.